Join digital forensic investigator and PI Ed Opperman for an in-depth discussion of conspiracy theories, strategy of New World Order resistance, high-profile court cases in the news, and interviews with expert guests and authors on these topics and more. It's the Opperman Report. And now, here is investigator Ed Opperman. Okay, welcome to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, Private Investigator Ed Opperman, and this show is brought to you by EmailRevealer.com. Uh, also, it's brought to you by uh, our newest sponsor, Miguel Lasala, author of The Rodeo of Doom. You can get a, there's a link to that book in the Opperman Report bookstore. And uh, our second newest sponsor, uh, MichiganMushrooms.net. Uh, you can check out their Facebook page at Michigan Mushrooms LLC. If this is the first time you're listening to our show, uh, please check out OppermanReport.com. We have a special members section there uh, with all kinds of exclusive content that you don't find uh, free uh, here as you're listening to it on the radio. It's all uh, exclusive content, uh, special interviews and stuff that we put up in our special members section available only to subscribers. Uh, today is our first broadcast on a brand new station, Renegade Talk Radio. Uh, it's the old Rick and Marla station. So this is going to be our debut broadcast on there. We've got a really good guest uh, Chuck Ocelli. He's the host of The Ocelli Effect, and he's also known as the Blind JFK Researcher. Uh, Chuck had me on a show a couple months back. Uh, we had a great time. I think it was on a Saturday night. I had a couple of beers, and uh, we kind of went everywhere, and we got along pretty good. Uh, so, uh, Chuck, you're there. Oh, yeah, absolutely. And, and uh, of course, that's the atmosphere on my show a lot of times. Uh, we just sort of kick back and uh, have a little something to drink and have a discussion. You know, it's the uh, the revelation of the conversation on the Ocelli effect. That's the way it works. So <laughs> it was a good time, though. Yeah, yeah. And, and also, too, you're a lot like me also, too, that uh, you don't do a lot of um, pre-interview with the guests. You just go on live in the end and talk to them for the first time. Yeah, uh, un unless they're a repeat guest. Uh, yeah, I don't I don't believe in the pre-interview process. I, I don't like to script. I don't like to choreograph. You know, uh, it's it's not part of the process for me. I think it's much more fascinating and intriguing to uh, to have that first interview. And uh, when you're investigating anything, as you know, as you well know, <laughs> as an investigator, uh, that that first impression that uh, that you often make determines a great deal about the subject that you are deposing in one way or another, doesn't it? Yes, yeah, that is so true. Real quick, though, uh, now when does your show come on? You're on American Freedom Radio, right? Oh, right, yeah. Well, let's, let's get the obligatory plugs out of the way. Uh, here we go. I'm on American Freedom Radio, and I'm on Monday through Friday now, uh, 8 to 10 p.m. Eastern. Okay, and uh, also if you go to Ocelli.com, which is my website, there's a player there for American Freedom Radio. It's also uh, heard on a lot of other websites, and uh, there's a bunch of affiliates and things. I can't really keep track of it all, but uh, but there it is. That's the easiest way to find it. And uh, if you don't know how to spell my name, by the way, it's O C H E L L I. Not the most uh, common name among those with vowels at the end, but hey, there it is. So, all right, no more plugs. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> now, now, well, you, you grew up on the East Coast, right? Where'd you grow up? Uh, mainly in New Jersey, you know, uh, the the middle to the northern part of New Jersey, New York area, this kind of thing. I call uh, I call Neptune, New Jersey, my hometown, um, which is right next to a place called Asbury Park, which uh, a lot of people know of because of Bruce Springsteen and that kind of thing. You know, they're saying now that if you go to the boardwalk on Asbury Park that you can't see the water. <laughs> well, part of it you never you never really could because of the way it was set up. Okay. Um, and you know, understand I was born in in the early 70s, so uh, so I never knew Asbury Park in its heyday as it's always been described to me where it was like a great uh, sort of area of commerce and you had the amusements and things like that. I always knew it as the broken down, uh, you know, boarded up buildings kind of area. That's that's where I grew up, you know. <laughs> yeah, it was really sad in the 70s and 80s. Uh, but I was born in 62, and I, my first vacation, my first family vacation from the Bronx when we first got our car, 
<laughs> when we can put my father bought this car for a thousand bucks uh was asbury park we went down to asbury park they had the amusement park then i can remember it like it was yesterday i can remember that boardwalk and uh, going through that the, 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 the fun house you know and all that stuff uh i got some great memories of the real asbury park you would have seen uh, uh places that i knew of as the remnants of that uh at, at their you know at their apex kind of of existence uh like uh, palace amusements and the casino yes. uh, amusements and things like that yeah but uh, also a great town for music way outside of bruce springsteen there's there's a lot of guys who came to that area and uh, i was actually a musician as a teenager and as a young adult in in, uh, in asbury park and played places like the stone pony and uh, uh stuff like that i mean a lot of strip clubs and everything as i was growing up there which weren't in existence when uh, when you went down there at first but uh, a lot of dive bars biker bars places like that uh places that made a name for themselves like mrs j's or uh or again the stone pony uh club benet's a little further north up in sayreville um but there was the t-birds cafe and all kinds of places like that and that's kind of where i made a living as a young adult is doing that <laughs> so <laughs> well, that yeah so many memories because you know i grew up in staten island and uh you know all through high school and stuff we would go down to to uh, uh, Seaside Heights, you know, and uh, and then later on, uh, it was more of an adult. We had a place down at uh, uh, Cape May, New Jersey, down at the uh, Wildwood uh, Wildwood Crest. Uh, so driving through all those towns, I remember all of that stuff. It just brings back so many memories. Oh yeah, the the amusements ran from Long Branch all the way to Cape May, you know, in different sections, and uh, Seaside Heights is still going now. Uh, of course, it was devastated by uh, Hurricane Sandy. Uh, a few years back and and a lot of destruction to that area the long beach island area and all that but uh but definitely a fascinating place and uh uh you know the the summertime traffic in in that area was always always like the big rush for the year for the businesses and everything else and also a great time to be a musician because we got a lot of you guys out of new york that would come to the clubs to see us and next thing you know is we'd be playing the clubs in new york too so <laughs> it was always good now do you still live down there no, actually, I moved to North Carolina. Okay. God help me. So that's where I'm sitting as we speak. Is that right, y'all? <laughs> y'all. Okay. What'd you do that for? How'd that come about? Well, uh, my first wife moved oh. down here with uh, with my kids we, after we divorced. Oh. And uh, so I kind of followed on to uh, to try and stay in close proximity to them. Um, you know, and then uh, more recently, I had a later in life baby. So he's about a year and a half old as we speak. And my other ones, you know, they were born in 99 and 2002. So, you know, a little bit of a different relationship with, uh, with them than I have with him. So <laughs> it is what it is. I mean, that's the main reason why I came down here. Also, it was cheaper yeah. to, to live here. And of course, New Jersey is excessively expensive to live in, uh, considering what you get for your money. And, uh, so there you go. But, uh, believe me, it's still not a, not a great place to be. I'm, I'm still in search of a, uh, a better place to land. And perhaps if I, uh, get a little more financially stable, I'll move myself back up to that tri-state area again. Cause I'll always think of it as home no matter what. Yeah. I know what you mean. I've tried to go back and just visit New York and Staten Island. It's just, you know, I've been gone for a long time since 2000 and it's just so different now. I don't, I don't know. I think I could ever go back. Uh, now, let me ask you this. So they, now, they call you the blind JFK researcher. Are you actually blind? Uh, technically, I would be legally blind. Okay. Um, and what that let, – let's give a translation. That could mean a lot of different things. Um, I've got about 10% of the vision that an average person has. So why did I end up with the blind JFK researcher thing? Well, I used to work in group projects with people on, uh, on Kennedy assassination research as well as, uh, you know, Watergate-related issues, deep political stuff, historical interest um, in the 90s and – well, mainly in the 90s is when it started. And um, what happened was I used to wind up carrying around magnifying glasses, and I used to actually use a small closed-circuit TV to uh, to uh, magnify things and stuff like that. And uh, we would get on these conference calls, and there was more than one guy named Chuck. So after a while, to identify me, it was like, yeah, the blind one. 
because I would be staring at documents with these, you know, full page magnifiers and different things like that. And of course, I stood out among these other researchers uh, who had better eyesight. So I kind of went with it and thought to myself, you know what, if I can take the uh, the time and effort to read through this stuff and get tagged with, you know, being the blind one among the researchers. Well, you know, what the hell is everybody else's excuse for not bothering to know about these things? So I kind of went with it. <laughs> How old were you when you got into JFK? I would say I was just about to finish high school. And, uh, you know, as I said, I was kind of a musician. So I did that as a teenager as well. You know, used to have a fake ID so I could play, uh, you know, different bars and things like that. Uh, so I started to read, you know, just books. And um, while I was traveling to different places, even going to Pennsylvania or going out to Texas or wherever else, uh, I would read realized that I was in close proximity to some of the people I was reading about. And uh, so I would take out what they used to call a phone book. There's an antiquated thing now, right? Yeah. Uh, a phone book and look up somebody and say, hey, you know, let me find this person. I'd find them in the, uh, you know, in the phone book and decide to call them up. And I would just simply ask them, hey, you know, are you this person I'm reading about? And, uh, you know, some people hung up on me, but some people would stay on the phone and just discuss the uh, the reality of what they saw, what they experienced, what they really knew. And uh, and I just got intrigued by that, you know, um, just sort of happenstance in, in that way. And as I started to develop more and more of these things and talk to some people that uh, seemed to not be in other people's reach, like James Tagg, who was the third wounded man that day, and uh, uh, like Dr. Ebersol, who was in charge of the x-rays at Bethesda and things like that, people that I encountered over the years, um, you know, it just became interesting to others who really wanted to make a living at that. So I wound up participating in stuff and handing over interviews to people that were writing books and making documentaries and things like that. And it just uh, it kind of grew from there. <laughs> now, being on the East Coast, do you remember when Alan Combs uh, had the he was on WABC? And he, every year he would do his JFK uh, radio show. Yeah, Alan Combs, I remember going on ABC. And I also remember him before that, I think, briefly on NBC. Uh, both of them were AM radio stations. And uh, that was one of the things that he would talk about now and then before, you know, before his days as uh, one half of a duo at Fox News, right? <laughs> yeah, you would think he, he never mentions it anymore, you know? you And he was, this guy was an authority, man. This guy knew such minutiae uh, back in those days. It was amazing. Uh, I'll never forget. Uh, but when he went on Fox News, that was it. He, you know, he just sold his soul and he never said another word. Well, yeah, that's the funny thing. And I love cartoons even to this day. And uh, one of the funniest cartoons I've ever seen depicting Alan Combs was, uh, was you know, j they show the Hannity and Combs like in cartoon version on Family Guy. Yeah. And uh, who did they make Alan Combs out to be was, uh, you remember a, a character called uh, Droopy Dog? Yeah, Deputy Droop, yeah. <laughs> so I, he's like, well, I don't know, you know, and uh, Sean's yelling at him, well, you must be, you must hate America, Alan. You, you're, you're so somebody who hates America because you're a liberal, Alan. And uh, Droopy Dog sits there and goes, well, Sean, I don't know about that. And uh, that's the way I, I really think that that was a perfect way to, to sort of characterize <laughs> what happened to Alan Combs once he got the uh, the big contract. But yeah, I remember him as, as sort of an independent minded uh, uh, liberal radio guy. And uh, he, 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 you thought he was going to give some opposition to a guy like uh, Sean Hannity. But uh, no. <laughs> yeah, he was a stand-up comedian, too. He used to do stand-up comedy down at Pip's uh, Comedy Club in Sheepshead Bay. Yeah, I, I some I vaguely remember, I think, him maybe even going to uh, some of those places that were going back and forth between being restaurants and comedy clubs. Yeah. Uh, like, a lot of people don't remember that uh, uh, Al Lewis from the Munsters. Sure. Right. Used to have a, a, a place like an Italian restaurant sort of called uh, Grandpa Al's, I think it was. And uh, every now and then he would have comedy performances. I, I vaguely remember that Alan might have done one of those. Well, he, OK. Uh, uh, Al Lewis, Grandpa Al Lewis owned a, a restaurant in Manhattan. But then later on, he owned a full time comedy club on Staten Island. Grandpa's it was on New Dorp Lane, right by nearby the office I had over there in New, New Dorp Lane. Uh, oh. oh, yeah. Full time comedy club. He's a legend, you know. 
Oh, yeah. Well, Grandpa Al was kind of a fascinating guy, yeah. uh, <laughs> you know, way beyond the Munsters character. But uh, I, I, I always I always found him interesting. I don't remember him owning the you know what? Now that you mention it, I do remember him owning a comedy club. But I thought that uh, Combs might have done the comedy club or he might have done the uh, the restaurant or maybe both. I don't know. But uh, but I vaguely remember that. Um you know, and uh, Alan was an interesting guy, and again, one of these guys who, as soon as he, uh, as soon as he gets the money, seems to, uh, you know, quiet down quite a bit. <laughs> yeah, you notice that too, huh? <laughs> you know. Oh boy. Yeah. So, so where do you come down on on JFK? What, what is your uh, conclusion? Well, you know, conclusion is hard to get to. To be honest with you, there there is so much information out there, and uh, and and so much uh, stuff that masquerades as information. It, it becomes a, a really interesting uh, sort of nexus of things that one encounters. Um, to give the most basic answer to what I think happened. Uh, regarding the assassination is that you don't have a lone nut shooter. That's for sure. That's something that I, that I state emphatically. Uh, what you have is a uh, is a situation that emerged because of a convergence of different intelligence uh, community assets. Let's just call them uh, kind of coming together and for uh, for mutual interest once again. Uh, they decided to eliminate this guy because he was bucking a lot of the system and uh, was going to uh, take a lot of money out of people's pockets and uh, make things hard for people in the future, not the least of which was uh, was the fact that he was going to remove us from Vietnam. Uh, when one examines uh, National Security Action Memorandum 263, uh, you know, JFK's plan in 1963, mind you, was to have all American personnel out of Vietnam by the end of calendar year 1965. Now, that would have made it very difficult for the people that made fortunes off of that war and for the people who made uh, fortunes off of all of the ancillary connected businesses to it uh, uh, to, to have, you know, done what they did. And, uh, of course, that would have irrevocably changed American society, in my estimation. And, uh, and I think of that as the, uh, as the greatest motive. Now, the people that came together on that would include individuals that were involved in the military-industrial complex uh, in addition to the, uh, the Central Intelligence Agency and others involved in the intelligence community, which there is a difference. You know, after all, uh, he was very much not giving in to them uh, regarding a, a, a myriad of operations throughout the world. And uh, most notably had even dismissed, uh, you know, CIA head Alan Dulles a couple of years before after the Bay of Pigs fiasco, although technically he resigned. Uh, he and most of his deputies were were uh, very much asked to resign, and I think that might have been one of the things that uh, that certainly got him killed. What do you make of, uh, you hear these recent theories that are really uh, out there, that, you know, that uh, the Zabruder film has been tampered with, and uh, is, is what do you make of that? Well, th there's a lot of theories that are out there. I mean, yeah. you don't have enough time on this show or probably the next five to go through the, uh, the bizarre out there theories. Um, when it comes to the Zabruder film, you have an interesting mixture of things here. I, I, I think that uh, it, is, it is difficult for anybody to say that there was no tampering with the Zabruder film. Uh, something is very wrong with some of it. Uh, however, those that claim that it's been uh, manufactured, you know, uh, Hollywood style and all of this, I think, are way off base as well. Uh, unfortunately, the answer lies somewhere in between. And it's fascinating because you do actually have uh, uh, four films which captured the, the moment of the headshot from JFK that day. And they're all home movies. Uh, no professional film exists. Right. And uh, I, I've always found that rather suspect because there was a Navy photographer with him uh, filming a documentary at the time, oh, really? you know, uh, but th somehow they didn't capture Dealey Plaza. They even captured the uh, the Newman family uh, uh, covering their children on the grassy knoll, uh, you know, and that's that's where those famous photos come from is from a, a Navy photographer whose name eludes me at the moment. But um, he made a film that was uh, later titled The Last Two Days, if you go and look for it. And that's the only professionally shot film of the motorcade that day in Dallas. 
Um, there's various news footage of stuff before that and, of course, the Parkland Hospital afterwards. But um, but it's interesting that you're left with these four home movies, uh, one taken by Abraham Zabruder, one taken by Orville Nix, one taken by Marie Muchmore, and the last one by a guy named Mark Bell. And uh, those are the only ones that actually captured the uh, really the, the moment of the murder, which is remarkable in and of itself. So... So, and when you say you think it was, there was some tampering. Okay, uh, what what do you describe as a tampering? Because some people have these uh, theories that the whole thing is, like you said, staged. And uh, I don't, you're just saying that those few scenes were edited out when it was going behind the. Uh, uh, the well, uh, here's the problem, yeah. right? You have you have frames that are missing, right. which uh, you know from. Well, all right, let's begin from the beginning. In, in the mid 1990s, they tried to uh, to verify the film's authenticity. And this was very difficult to do. And there are questions about whether the original film is actually in anyone's hands publicly that we know of. Um, so so there is that problem to begin with. Secondly, Time Life, who had possession of the film for many years, uh, claims to have damaged it. There are a handful of frames which are missing from the film. Uh, so you have these damages to begin with. You have sort of a nefarious uh, uh, lineage or pedigree for the thing uh, based on the different stories that have evolved about it. And uh, it seems to me as though it, it would be rife for manipulation and it would be something that I would say would be tampered with as a matter of changing the public evidence. But here's the problem. Um, when one compares the forensic uh, concepts of what occurred that day, you know, the x-rays, the uh, what has been publicly released as the autopsy films, which, by the way, when you see those, that's part of a bootleg set that was not meant for public consumption. But either way, when you put them together with the Zapruder film, the Zapruder film is not inconsistent with the injuries that uh, that are observable and uh, and part of the uh, record regarding Kennedy's body that day. So you don't have a film that is completely out of line with those injuries. What you do have is a set of injuries, though, based on uh, modern forensic techniques that uh, that tell you that you don't any longer have a headshot from the rear or from the side grassy knoll area. Uh, what's interesting now is that if you really look at it based on the uh, the most uh, you know the most recent techniques that are acceptable in the field of uh, of uh, forensic pathology, you'll understand that you actually have evidence of a frontal headshot, um, which is completely bizarre and uh, and not part of uh, almost anybody's solution regarding this. I mean, of course, there's a million uh, different theories. But what I'm saying is that the hard evidence actually points to something that is completely contradictory to the official record and the majority of the conspiracy theories that have been uh, uh, sort of bandied about over the years as well. Right, because you hear these other theories, like the the limousine driver turned around and took a shot. You even hear theories where they're saying recently that uh, Jackie had, <laughs> took a shot at him, you know, in the car, and and she was doing some odd things with his, you know, head and his neck and stuff. Uh, would you make anything out of those kind of things? Yeah, I've heard every. <laughs> you, you wouldn't believe it. Jackie shot him is one of my favorite uh, yeah. uh, crazy ideas. Uh, another one is Annie Oakley style. John Connolly actually shot him. Okay. That that's another great one. I only heard about that one recently, to be honest with you. But uh, you know, give them time and they'll come up with it. The the limo driver thing made a lot of traction for a lot of years yeah. because a, a guy named Bill Cooper had a really bad copy of the Zapruder film uh, where, you know, a lot of the color is washed out. There's a lot of distortion. It's a copy of a copy of a copy of a copy. And uh, when one takes a look at this, you know, visual mud, uh, you, you can observe something that, lo and behold, does appear as though the limo driver is holding a pistol. Um, but when you get a clearer copy, and today we can get uh, what they call a forensic copy from the National Archives, although it's not easily accessible, and you can't just call them up and order a DVD of it, okay? Uh, you can get a, a very, very uh, clear copy of this thing now, and there's no evidence whatsoever that the Secret Service driver in that film uh, uh, ever turned and fired on him, and the truth is that that's the only real evidence that there ever was is this muddy film for that. 
uh, Jackie shot him and everything else. Well, listen, Ed, I could tell you that an alien hanging from his toes uh, on an invisible UFO actually, you know, hung upside down and popped him right in the face with a, with a ray gun, if you like. And, uh, hey, I bet you I could uh, conjure up something that would appear as though it was suggestive of it, but it doesn't mean that it's evidence and it doesn't mean it's anything more than a figment of my imagination, you know? <laughs> yeah, because even more recently, they're coming out saying that the whole thing was a hoax. It was staged with crisis actors, you know? It's, it's, it, well, it's really amazing. It's really amazing. Now, now what about the, from, from the sewers? They said some kind of might, might have been a, uh, shooters in the sewers. Yeah, see, what's interesting about that is if you – okay, there, there's two ways to look at this. And people think that there's uh, somebody who could have possibly shot from uh, what they call uh, uh, like, a, like a drainage grate which is at ground level at that time. Um, and in order to do that, it's, it's impossible to have remained obscured and, and, uh, and have pulled that off. That's physically impossible. Unless you want to consider that somebody basically stuck their arm out of a sewer grate and uh, was able to aim and shoot and score that headshot so well, um, you know, uh, it's, it's really, one, uh, yet again, one of these ludicrous theories. However... If you want to take a look at the rest of the drainage system and you take a look at the uh, the part of it that was over by the triple underpass, which is the railroad bridge in front of the limousine. Remember, I said to you earlier that there's uh, fairly good forensic evidence that uh, that we have a frontal headshot. Well, if you take a look at that part of the drainage area, somebody could have disappeared into that drain immediately after firing a shot, and uh, that would line up with the the apparent trajectory, which uh, which somebody like Sherry Feaster, uh, who uh, wrote a book on it, who was a crime scene investigator, uh, has has sort of postulated, in a way, based on the evidence. What about um, uh, uh, Jim Rothstein says that uh, you know when he arrested uh, Frank Sturgis, that Sturgis confessed. To being one of the shooters. What do you make of that story? Mm. Well, Frank Sturgis, interesting character in and of himself. Oh, yeah. Um, but here's the thing. When I've interacted with people that interacted with Sturgis, um, you know, this guy making claims or sort of puffing up his own chest about, uh, you know, the, the great things or the uh, wild things he might have been involved in, this is, you know par for the course with this guy um that's one thing this the next thing is that you know simply because an individual says it listen there's a guy uh, named james sutton who uh, most of the public knows as james files um that claims to have been the grassy knoll shooter you know uh there's been a lot of claims over the years alleged confessions i mean the uh the alleged uh deathbed confession of e howard hunt which uh which you know is completely uh completely out there as well you know claiming that he would know the command structure all the way up to lbj uh you know bringing people like cord meyer into it and things like that i mean it, it's endless the amounts of confessions and alleged uh you know and and alleged people that say that they were involved uh you know marita lorenz uh saying that she was at a meeting with hunt and oswald and everybody and uh, God help us, Ed. You know, it's it's actually endless. There's, uh, you know, there's one crime and there's about 50 uh, so-called partial confessions out there from all these different subjects. And I dare say there wasn't 50 guns present in Dealey Plaza, you know. Very interesting. Very interesting. Uh, so then what do you make of that of the, uh, the, the, uh, the videotape of uh, Hunt and his uh, confession? Just staged just for the fun of it or? Well, no, but you got to remember that that Hunt was somebody who, you know, also wrote uh, spy novels right. um, and things like that. He was very sick. What they call the deathbed confession, that really wasn't his deathbed. He passed away a few years later. Um, and I'm not sure that those conversations are in context uh, for what they were supposed to be, um, you know, and I don't even want to speak to what I think of his son or anything like that. We'll leave him out of it. Let's just talk about E. Howard Hunt for a moment. This is the kind of guy who, who, you know, relished disinformation. Yeah. So, 
either it could have been in in my opinion it sounds more like uh the uh the semi fictional construct of something that maybe he wanted to uh write or hand over to someone else uh for some other purpose but i don't believe it was a a, a true confession um and even if it was you know to call e howard hunt a liar i don't think uh would be would be uh, too far out of bounds either. So either way, I, I don't think you have very much. And when you take a look at some of what is encompassed in his alleged confession, uh, there's some easily discreditable things there, like uh, the French gunman story, right. <clears throat> you know, and uh, and other people that, uh, that are supposed to be present in Dealey Plaza, which over the years we've learned uh, could not have possibly been physically in uh, in two places at once because we can verify where they were and things like that so his supposed confession falls apart for various reasons and plus you know again consider the source okay we're going to take a commercial break right now uh we're with chuck Achelli, o-c-h-e-l-l-i he's the host of uh, the Achelli effect you can find that on american freedom radio uh, five nights a week, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time. It's a two-hour show or one-hour show? Two hours, right? Two hours, yep. It's also known as the blind JFK researcher. So all this stuff, all these search terms, you can find very, very easily. Uh, okay, we'll, we'll come back. I got so much to ask you. I okay, we'll be right back after these messages with more of Chuck Ocelli right after that. You got it. And now a word from our sponsors. Pacific West Bamboo your premier source for sustainable building material. They provide construction grade and craft grade bamboo material for all your indoor, outdoor, and gardening needs. Uh, contact them for event planning and display building as well. 503-839-8126. Or you go to their new website, pacificwestbamboo.com. Or you can contact them on Facebook at Pacific West Bamboo. That's 503 839 8126. Amanda from Pacific West Bamboo was our first sponsor. Uh, she's been so good to us, uh, so please support her in return. I want to make everybody aware of our new member section at www.oppermanreport.com. Uh, you can go there and sign up for a monthly, quarterly, or yearly subscription. You can even purchase episodes one by one. Uh, you get full access to brand new original content, new guests, new uncensored interviews, my own investigations and reports, and we're going to be adding uh, sections with documents, images, police reports, uh, either provided by myself or by my guests or for my own investigations, my own reports. Uh, so you can go to oppermanreport.com and you can sign up there tonight. You can start listening tonight. Straw Man. I want to mention Straw Man. Straw Man is a band uh, out of Toronto, Canada. Uh, they're good friends of the Opperman Report. Uh, they're a trio of guys who share the same mindset uh, most of us here do, and they put that energy into their words and music. Uh, so check them out at uh, strawmanmusic.com and drop them a line uh, to let them know that you heard them here on the Opperman Report. Uh, we'll be doing a, an interview with Sean Duffy soon. You can get an autographed copy of my book, How to Succeed as a Private Investigator, by visiting my PI website, emailrevealer.com. We also offer a computer and cell phone forensics. We can recover deleted text messages to uncover infidelity. Uh, we, can, uh, we offer asset searches, locates, email tracing, background reports, and we can even trace your spouse's email address back to internet dating websites to catch them cheating online. You can reach us at 800-572-9762, or you can email me at emailrevealer at AOL.com. New World Mexican Women. Everyone loves the New World Mexican Women. And their, their line of fine, handcrafted, authentic ju Mexican jewelry of stone mosaic and abalene stone inlay. In their first book, titled New World Mexican Women, available on lulu.com, uh, they teach you how to make this jewelry. And they have a collection of love letters to their men from their hometown that have immigrated to the United States to find work. Uh, they have also published a new book entitled Azukina to the Rodeo. It's about a young girl that falls in love with a rodeo bull rider, and she runs away with him uh, without telling her family. You can find the New World Mexican Women by Googling New World Mexican Women, 
and you can ask them about the, their deals on wholesaling, their fine jewelry, and all of the other projects that they have going on. Uh, if you'd like to have your business or website advertised here and promoted all over the world on dozens of stations every day, give us a call at 800-572-9762 or email oppermanreport at gmail.com. And now back to our show. Well, not so soon. First, we're going to talk about MichiganMushrooms.net. Uh, they offer the highest quality chaga chunks available anywhere, picked fresh from healthy live trees uh, in Michigan's Upper Peninsula, sun-dried, and quickly shipped to you. Uh, they're very proud of their long-standing reputation as trusted farmers and collectors of wild gourmet and medicinal mushrooms. Customer service and offering high-quality products is very important to them. And they have a strict grading system that begins in the woods, and they would rather pass up a chunk that looks bad instead of passing it off uh, to you, the customer. Additionally, they are recognized by the state of Michigan as mushroom experts. They are certified by the Department of Agriculture to sell 20 different species of mushrooms. And proof of this certification is available upon request. That is michiganmushrooms.net or on Facebook, Michigan Mushrooms LLC. Got a brand new sponsor, The Rodeo of Doom by Miguel La Sala. Uh, the year is 2384, and Henry Fields is a down-on-his-luck adjunct professor in the architecture department at Andreas Tangen University in Los Angeles. But he has one thing going for him that others don't. He has enough of the coveted EP14 to live to be 200 if he wants to. Not that hard. When he saves a woman for certain death with a few drops of the EP-14, a corrupt government agency tries to blackmail him into selling off his supply. Just when it seems like it might be a good idea, all hell breaks loose. The Rodeo of Doom was written by Miguel La Sala and edited by Margaret A. Harrell, the author of Keep This Quiet, memoir series. Uh, now, she was also the uh, copy edited uh, Hunter S. Thompson's breakthrough book, Hell's Angels. According to ha uh, Harold, the rodeo of doom will grip you and pull you into the wild ride of a different reality. This is a consciously fast-paced journey into the future. Author Miguel La Sala reveals his craft by intric intricately weaving in fine details for his reader and keeps you anxiously anticipating what will happen next. Do not wait to read this book. There will surely be more to come from this author. The Rodeo of Doom is available on Amazon.com, and there's a link to the Rodeo of Doom in the Opperman Report bookstore. Okay, welcome back to the Opperman Report. I'm your host, private investigator Ed Opperman. Uh, we are here back with uh, Chuck Ocelli, host of the Ocelli Effect also known as the blind JFK researcher, uh, but uh, it covers on, on his show, The, the Ocelli Effect, at uh, 8 p.m. Uh, Eastern Time on American Freedom Radio. You cover every topic, not just JFK, right? Oh, yeah. Uh, we, we cover everything from, uh, you know, current events to ancient history, if you like. I mean, uh, I actually have uh, tried to cover some some issues of spirituality. I mean, uh, I've even uh, discussed, you know, different movements and things. Uh, you know, kind of, it's kind of an interesting mixture of stuff. Uh, not not always focused on the Kennedy assassination, although it does come up in conversation. <laughs> you know, well, yeah, well, it's obvious you're an expert. <laughs> okay, without, you know, without uh, even uh, there's no question about that. I, and I love to talk to people like you that have this information off the tip of your tongue. What do you make of Doug Caddy? <laughs> Doug Caddy. Uh, well, re refresh my memory as to uh, as to who he is. Okay, he was the uh, the first lawyer for the Watergate burglars. He also worked uh, with uh, E. Howard Hunt at E. Howard Hunt's front job at that uh, PR company, at the public relations firm. In fact, they shared an office, uh, and he was also hooked up uh, with um, uh, 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 Guy Bannister. He knew Guy Bannister through politics. Uh, mm. So what do you make a hit? Now he, and he's the one that he claims that E. Howard Hunt, he asked him what was behind the motive for killing JFK. And Hunt told him it's the alien presence to cover up the alien presence. Now, you must have heard that story, right? 
Well, yeah, this gets to the uh, the like majestic uh, documents and all that kind of stuff. And, you know, once again, I, I say that uh, I, and I, I won't even challenge that guy's story. I, I don't know. I would look to verify uh, exactly, you know, how much contact he had with Hunt, because there's a lot of people that have had contact with uh, with some of these individuals and have made a lot of extraordinary claims. And uh, not all of them can be correct. But let's leave that alone. And let's just say that he made that statement. Statement. Uh, and let's just say that he actually heard it from uh, Hunt's own lips. I say again that Hunt is is a, a, an amazing disinformationalist uh, over the years. He had said several things to several people. And even if you can verify 20 percent of it, uh, you have a divergent group of statements here. And uh, it doesn't seem to me as though that would be a. That would be a solid motive. It doesn't make much logical sense to me that that was the big deal there. Uh, I say again, when you got a guy who is uh, irritating people in big business, irritating people in the intelligence community, uh, irritating people who make their living off of war, uh, you know, and and making uh, wild statements to uh, American University, I mean, publicly to American University and to the United Nations in the, uh, you know, in in the uh, spirit of you know, hey, how about cooperation with the Soviet Union? which uh, was a, a big, scary thing. Uh, of course, when it comes to the space race and all that kind of consideration, today we have the International Space Station, and we know how that works. Uh, but uh, but at that time, I mean, there was uh, a different atmosphere. And uh, when you talk about cooperation with the Cold War enemies and uh, not relying on uh, the intelligence community to behave itself and also not giving them the invasion into Cuba, which they wanted, not giving into uh the people that wanted to make the fortunes that they did uh, off of the Vietnam War, uh, you know, those to me sound like a whole lot more solid motives than worrying that uh, that Kennedy was going to reveal that ETs are real. You know, I you. <laughs> yeah. Uh, well, when I talked to St. John Hunt, St. Vincent Hunt, uh, he confirmed that they were really close friends. He came to the funeral, that kind of stuff like that. Uh, but he didn't buy into the whole alien presence thing, thing either. Uh, now, what do you make of uh, this new book out about General Walker? Uh, but I believe it's Dr. Caulfield. Mm. Well, Walker's an interesting figure, again, in and of himself. And, of course, the reason why he comes into play uh, with the Kennedy assassination is not simply because of his uh, presence as a, uh, a sort of right-wing political figure at the time, but uh, but also people believe that Oswald took a shot at him uh, previous to the Kennedy assassination, and this is uh, part of the uh, Warren Commission's alleged supporting evidence. Now, what I find most fascinating about that is that Walker, after somebody did take a shot at his head in his, in his uh, home, uh, dug the bullet out of the wall himself. And, uh, you know, it's kind of fascinating. It doesn't appear, based on Walker's description of the uh, projectile, that it would have been the alleged gun that Oswald's supposed to have had in his possession. And why do I say alleged gun? Well, believe it or not, the chain of evidence regarding whether he had possession of the man liquor Carcano is questionable. Uh, you know, the the idea that he had a possession of the handgun that he used to kill J.D. Tippett is questionable. Um, and I think that General Walker is just uh, one of those rather divisive figures that was uh, around at the time. Um, and, uh, and, and, and definitely a guy of interest. I mean, there was a lot of things that I think have been forgotten by uh, contemporary historians regarding the, uh, the different atmosphere we had at the time. The John Birch Society was, uh, was a much larger player on the scene than they would be today, you know, um, although, hey, right wingers exist no matter uh, no matter what uh, uh, facet of 20th century history we're looking at, I guess. And uh, Walker is one of those guys. I, I don't think that uh, that uh, General Walker plays into the assassination uh, in any other way, except that uh, that he was sort of dragged into it by this allegation that Oswald took a shot at him, you know. Okay, yeah. Uh, check out this guy, Caulfield. He, he's got some really good information about stuff they found in, uh, 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 what's his name, uh, Ruby's Pockets uh, that connect him to the John Birch Society and all kinds of stuff. Very, this guy spent his last 30 years uh, compiling his research for this book, and it's really annotated very well. Uh, mm. Good guy. I think you'd like but it. 
Yeah. Well, you got to remember, that, and that's another thing really quickly, Ed, is that the literature, when it comes to this case, there is no single event in world history, to my knowledge, that uh, that has ever been more prolifically written about uh, in a literary sense. Uh, the last time I attempted to count the amount of books that were released by mainstream publishing houses uh, was, well, a decade ago, and there was more than 1,000 separate uh, pieces of literature that were easily accessible, you know, and that's not counting the monographs. That's not counting the smaller publishing houses. That's not counting the independent publications uh, over the years. So there are literally thousands of books that are centered around this six to eight seconds in Dallas and all of the peripheral figures and things that occurred around it. Jack Ruby is an interesting guy because he ingratiated himself to nearly anyone that uh, that wielded any sort of power anywhere uh, and and uh, is really a fascinating character who I dare say, even if you spent uh, another 30 years, this guy investigating Ruby, he wouldn't get all the answers that uh, that he needs to paint a complete portrait of the man. Very interesting and strange character. And of course, this is the guy who commits the first uh, live television murder in my in my understanding uh, that was ever broadcast live when he pumps a, a bullet into the gut of Lee Harvey Oswald in the basement of the uh, of the, uh, uh, you know, City Hall there in, in Dallas. You know, while Oswald is cuffed to two officers, by the way, and in the presence of at least 70 others, uh, you know, scores of media and other onlookers. Well, you know, this guy walks up and pumps a bullet into his gut, which uh, even when I was nine years old, I found extremely bizarre and hard to believe. But anyway, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> no, no, you're right on target. And when you consider that the cop he's handcuffed to doesn't flinch. <laughs> you, know? Like, you know, at least holding them up, man. It doesn't flinch a bit. You know. Well, there, there's two of them. There's yeah. there's Jim LaBelle and Elsie Graves. Now, Graves I never spoke to, but uh, Jim LaBelle I spoke to, and he's he's the guy who everybody recognizes as having the large white Stetson on. He's the guy, you know, in the big white hat, right? Uh, from the uh, from the rather famous photographs of uh, of uh, Ruby leaping forward. There were two of them that uh, were up for the. Pulitzer Prize or whatever the great prize was uh, for photographic journalism that year. And one guy with like a fraction of a second difference in his photograph got it over the other one. Um, but uh, what's interesting is Lavelle and uh, and, and I'm, I'm willing to bet Graves also had trouble seeing because there are these very extreme lights on. Because remember, there were television cameras present. There's more than one angle there. And there were lights overhead that uh, definitely disrupted their, their vision. You know, so their line of sight was screwed up from that alone. Um, but even so, it's completely bizarre that he's got a cop cuffed to each side of him. You know, and he's almost in a point of four point protection as they're moving him out to the car, um, except for the fact that guess who breaks the uh, breaks the four point protection is the man up front who's the man in charge. You know, I don't know if you've ever noticed that watching the film of uh, of uh, Oswald being killed. But if uh, if the, uh, the the guy who was the head of the homicide division there didn't go ahead and walk way too far ahead. Ruby would have never had the, sh the chance to lunge forward. Really? Okay, I never, I never noticed that part. I got to look at that again. Yeah, take a look at it because you'll notice when he comes out. And all those guys with the white hats on are part of the uh, the homicide and uh, and robbery division there in Dallas. And uh, that was sort of their thing. They wore the white Stetsons, by the way. So that that's how you know who's who in, the, uh, you know, in that piece of film if you want to take a good look at it. Now, can you confirm, because I always get a question about this, because uh, you mentioned Tippett in the movie theater that that movie theater was owned by Frank Sinatra and that Frank Sinatra also was at the White House that day that the assassination took place? You know, I've never I've never actually looked into who owned the Texas theater at that time. I got to be honest with you. And, and Sinatra um, is is interesting all the way around when it comes to the Kennedys. Uh, because there's the allegations about what occurred in Chicago and whether Frank was actually the go-between between between the Kennedys and the mob guys there to sort of influence the uh, the local precincts and all that. And of course, Illinois was one of the key states in 1960. Uh, you know, for Kennedy's victory over Nixon, which was very slim. So 
you know, Sinatra's an interesting guy. I don't know so much about how he would be involved in it or whether he would really have a legitimate reason to participate in that. Um, but uh, but to be honest with you, I don't know who owned the Texas Theater at that time. I know who the, you know, the uh, uh, Butch, Butch Burroughs was uh, working there. I know that. And uh, there were other people that uh, I've encountered over the years that were working there or working in close proximity to it. Um, but uh, but I, I never did take a look at who actually owned it. Okay. What do you make of, because uh, I, I, I think my first... I was always interested, but my first real uh, fascination with the Kennedy assassination was when I was hanging out with the Yippies over there in Manhattan mm-hmm. on Bleecker Street. And uh, they came out in the Yipster Times, the Overthrow Magazine, about the three tramps, that, uh, the work that A.J. Weberman did in coup d'etat in America. Uh, what do you make of that, the three tramps and their, their connection to the Watergate burglars? Well, see, now, and, I, and I've been through that a lot of times, and, and, and I find that to be... Uh, you know, because a few years back, and and this is uh, say in the early '90s, I believe, uh, they actually tracked down some of these guys that are supposed to be the three tramps, and uh, and and I don't believe that they're the Watergate burglars. There was a guy named uh, Chauncey Holt, who uh, who also claims to have been the very same burglar, the very excuse me, not burglar, the very same tramp that uh, that is allegedly E. Howard Hunt as well. Um, and uh, he passed away a few years ago. And uh, interesting guy was a forger involved with movie people and mob guys and everything else. Uh, he claimed to have been the same tramp as Hunt. And uh, what's what's fascinating to me about that is that um, unless you're believing that these guys did it and then went and hid on the train. Uh, it's almost an irrelevancy. And when the Dallas police did open up their archives, uh, lo and behold, we do find the arrest records of some individuals, and you can identify who those guys were. And uh, quite honestly, I, I hate to say it, but uh, I think it was uh, the TV show A Current Affair some years back actually did track down the real guys who were taken into custody that day. What do you make of more recently, uh, and people talking about George H.W. Bush, uh, being photographed at the scene and, and then also that he was also to the the messenger who went from the CIA to the FBI with some uh, information okay there there's a document uh, which uh, is a mem is a memo uh, from J Edgar Hoover explaining how he met with a guy from the DIA and uh, and George Bush of the CIA and uh, of course Bush has always claimed that he had uh, no involvement with the agency until he became the head of the agency in 76 I think it was um, which is an absolute lie and let me just say this I, I would love to hang many many criminal uh, activities and charges and uh, love to see many members of the Bush family do a perp walk personally. Uh, unfortunately, I can't put a rifle in George H.W. Bush's hands in Dealey Plaza, and some people have literally tried to do that. Um, you know, first of all, the guy doesn't have the guts or the skill to pull it off. He was definitely an administrator. He was definitely a sleazy guy. He was definitely somebody who was tied to the agency as an asset very early on, has never been upfront about uh, his involvements and uh, his extracurricular activities, let's call them, in places like Cuba, uh, in places like like I'm willing to bet Haiti, although I don't have good enough evidence to definitively say that. Um, the Bush family, I call them the crime syndicate. They are the Bush crime family. However, these photographs that people claim to have of uh, George H.W. Bush and Dealey Plaza, if you do a comparison of the array of photographs that are available, you'll find that the same character who looks like Bush at one angle doesn't appear to be Bush at another angle, and uh, so on and so forth. And, and I do believe that it's been reasonably confirmed that he was in uh, a town not far from Dallas, uh, losing another election, which, you know, remember, this guy is so well CIA connected at the time that uh, uh, you know, he couldn't win elections for Congress or Senate or anything else. He was uh, often losing them. So the, the agency couldn't even bother to steal an election for the guy. Mm. That's how well connected he was at that time. Uh, of course, things have changed over the years, and uh, he definitely put in his work. And uh, meanwhile, he's not even the beginning of the problem. If you take a look at his father, you know, Prescott Bush, well, there's another 
wonderful rabbit hole to go down. So many, many crimes against humanity, many, many murders you could uh, tie to the Bush crime syndicate. Uh, either they provoked them, they facilitated them, whatever, whatever. Uh, however, the Kennedy assassination, unfortunately, I'd love to hang it around their necks. Both, you know, both him and Junior, I'd love to give it to him, but uh, I can't. <laughs> okay. Now, now, what about, I, I heard one other story a while back, too. It was a long time ago, that Ruby was somehow connected uh, to, I believe, the, the McCarthy hearings as an informant. Okay. Well, there's a document that uh, that states that he was working for, uh, you know, Richard Nixon. Right. Um, and and that's that's kind of fascinating. I, I've seen that uh, that possibly that document may not be legitimate. Uh, but let's just assume that it was. Ruby has a uh, you know, and I'm I'm giving you that regardless. You know, uh, I won't even challenge the veracity of the document. But here's the thing: uh, Ruby is the kind of guy who was willing to trade in information. Uh, it seems as though we have evidence that he may have uh, very well been an FBI informant. Uh, was uh, very much uh, you know bringing information back and forth between not a guy who was in the mob, but a guy who knew enough guys who were in, in, involved in organized criminal activity that he could bring information as a courier almost between some of these guys. Uh, even uh, some interesting uh, excursions to Cuba made by uh, Jack Rubenstein, you know, uh, is so definitely a fascinating character. I don't know whether he worked for the McCarthy, you know, uh, regime at that time, but uh, to imagine that he might have been a snitch or might have been utilizing information in order to uh, gain favors, you know, from uh, from individuals in law enforcement or to gain favors from individuals in the underworld in one way or another, completely plausible. Um, however, I, I don't know how good the evidence is for it. I wouldn't be shocked if that was uh, if that was true, though. Okay. I was going to ask you another question when I was asking about uh, Doug Caddy, and I just remembered what it was. Uh, mm -hmm. General Walker, the end of his career, uh, he was arrested for uh, uh, soliciting homosexual uh, sex in a men's room <laughs> at a park. <laughs> right? You got funny, <laughs> funny, Ed, just real quick here. Funny how a lot of these extreme right wing guys often get themselves caught up in these situations where uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> but you're right. But the thing is, so many people around this Doug Caddy, the homosexual, uh, they're openly homosexual, okay, General Walker, homosexual, David Ferry, Clay Shaw, all these guys. What do you make of that whole whole connection? But so many of these people around this were all homosexual. Do you know you are the only guy who has ever brought this up to me? Usually I'm the one mentioning this. Oh, there is a nexus of of uh, like the homosexual underground, which seems to have converged around all of these uh, sort of off the books, underworld kind of underground situations. And you're right. Clay Shaw, David Ferry, uh, you know, even when I started to study who Oswald, Lee Harvey Oswald, was associated with, there are people that today, and, I, and I'll tell you this, because I keep confidences when I interview somebody, if they ask me to, but there are individuals who are still closeted today who are not publicly known as homosexuals that were in close proximity to all sorts of figures that, that it's, they've never been outed publicly. There is a great nexus of this, and uh, some people have told me that uh, this may very well be because this was a, a good piece of leverage to have over somebody. Uh, you know, like Shaw was uh, was a usable asset for the agency, and of course, uh, to have his homosexuality revealed would have damaged him. He was a, he was a businessman. You know, and the agency utilized a lot of businessmen as assets in order to gain information, in order to gain uh, entry into different places, other countries, things like that. Um, but it is a rather bizarre thing that I have never been able to really answer is why there are so many of these guys that seem to have either bisexual or homosexual, uh, you know, orientations that are involved here. I, I, I cannot fathom why this uh, seems to be, you know, uh, a continuous pattern. And it's and it's really amazing. Well, we're going to have to get together again soon, because even in Watergate, too, that same thread seems to be involved there. Robert Merritt, the informant. Uh, and then uh, uh, the stuff about the, the call, uh, you know, the, the call girl operation that they were, the Watergate burglars, perhaps. Um, 
the motive was to get the catalog of the the the, uh, the boys, you know, of uh, homosexual uh, boy, not homosexual boys, but uh, male prostitutes that were being peddled around Washington at the time for blackmail purposes. Mm-hmm. Um, so we're going to have to get back uh, again soon. Um, what do you have coming up on your show, The Achelli Effect? It's uh, American Freedom Radio. Any any big guests coming up you're looking forward to? Well, you know, I, I have uh, this week. Well, we'll just talk about what's coming up this week. I, I'll have uh, Joan Mellon on, who's uh, been a prolific uh, biographer, actually wrote what I consider to be the definitive two books on Jim Garrison, who uh, who you know, is the only person to ever, actually ever bring a public trial regarding the uh, Kennedy assassination. Um, you know, but she's written many other books, uh, even including on figures like uh, George DeMorne Shield, um, you know, uh, b- 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 Mac Wallace. She wrote a book about which, you know, again, he ties into some of the crazier conspiracy theories. That's fascinating. Uh, J.P. Satilli is a constant uh, guest on my uh, program. He's from NewsVandal.com. I also have a, a running series with uh, Roger Landry from the Liberty Beacon. Uh, so there's your current events, your political activism. Uh, this kind of stuff. Uh, Carmine Savastano is working with me on uh, something called uh, what we're calling Sinister History, which is really going to focus on a lot of political assassinations, not just JFK, but the various others that have occurred. And uh, on Friday nights, I've got something that uh, defies description called Ocelli in the Greek. So this is with this uh, kind of unique underground figure uh, that calls himself the Greek. And uh, you, it's very hard to explain in in uh, in, in, in summation. But uh, I'm, I'm, you know, constantly uh, looking to have conversations with different people. Uh, Larry Hancock is coming up soon. Uh, interesting author on covert actions and um, even uh, Dean Henderson. And I'm not even sure what I'm going to talk to Dean Henderson about, but we shall see. <laughs> yeah, I've had him on. He can talk about anything. Chuck Ocelli, thank you so much, my friend. Okay, we got to have you back soon, okay, to fill in some more blanks here. i got a million JFK questions I could ask you all day long, and I know you know every single one. So thank you so much for coming on, man. I uh, really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.